Greetings, greetings, greetings. Um, this is Sarah Jenke, and I am very excited to um, introduce Gavin Horn to do today's webinar, Grand Rounds on um, Hierarchy of um, Contamination Control. Very excited that we have this as a topic because I think it's important for your fire service. Very excited that we have Gavin presenting on it because he's very difficult to schedule because he's usually out like burning stuff and doing like other really important, um, way more fascinating than the work I do, which not that surveys aren't fun and exciting, but I think Gavin's actually is, um, it has a, objectively a cooler job than I do. But um, really appreciate everyone taking the time to watch this. And I think you're gonna find it really interesting. Gavin's presentations are always fantastic. And um, I always learn something new. So without further ado, Gavin Horn used to be at Illinois Fire Service Institute for, um, for a long time, director there, and then moved out to Oregon where he wanted to be closer to wildlife. He was just explaining his wild turkeys in his backyard and deer that like to hang out. Um, so I, again, way cooler than I am, but it is what it is. Um, so I'm going to let him present and get you the information that you need. And thanks for checking us out. Gavin, take it away. Dun, 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 dun. All right. Well, it is always hard to uh, follow the introductions that you provide, but I'll do my best to uh, to try to share something that's cool with, with the crew. So, all right. Just want to verify uh, screen sharing here is, uh, is good to go. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Sarah, Melanie, and uh, everyone uh, in the Grand Rounds for the opportunity to, to share some information that we've uh, put together relatively recently. Um, in fact, this is actually the second time that I've presented uh, this material, though it's based on a paper that we published last year. Uh, for those of you who might have been at the uh, January week of uh, Scientific Fire Service Wonder, uh, this is a, a similar presentation. But uh, for the rest of you, hopefully this is some new material and possibly a new way of, of viewing contamination controls and, and how we might be able to implement uh, some contamination controls in the fire service. So um, for those of you who would like to follow along, uh, what this presentation does is really follow along with this manuscript, which we published in Journal of Occupational Environmental Hygiene in 2022. If you would like, uh, you can uh, take a, a clip of the uh, QR code there on the left. It'll take you directly to the manuscript and you can download it uh, for free. Um, and this is something that we can, we'll, we'll go through basically each one of the different sections of, of the paper here so that you can, can take this information back with you. Uh, the paper is a collaboration uh, between our group at the Fire Safety Research Institute along with IFSI Research um, and Kenny Fent and his team at NIOSH. Uh, this is a way of providing information, a great deal of information, a review of the current state of research, or at least the current state that was in late 2021 and early 2022, uh, in a way that hopefully makes it a little bit more digestible. So the goal is to help some of the, the researchers to uh, have a place where to go to find all of this information, at least at, at up to date uh, within a year ago, but also for the fire service. Oftentimes when we want to put different control measures in place, there can be some resistance, whether it's from you know, getting the funding in order to, to do some of these things. And oftentimes if you can put some uh, academic peer reviewed publications or resources down in front of those who are controlling the purse strings or, or making some of those decisions, whether that's through labor management relationship or on up to city, village, or county administration, the data can help to make some of those decisions go a little bit more clear, a little bit more smoothly. And so this is a place where I'll show you at the end of the presentation where you can find all of the different resources that have come into to this presentation. But as a kind of more academic journal article, it's not necessarily targeted at the fire service. So we have also put together a uh, free resource for aimed at the fire service that takes this information, goes through about a, a 30 minute online program that uh, again, covers much of the same information and can take you to some of the same resources, but doesn't quite have some of the, the same detail that you might find in those papers. More thought around how you might be able to implement this in the fire service. And the QR code right there can take you to where you can find that uh, online 
resource. I'll put both these QR codes up at the end of the presentation for anyone who might be interested in, in taking a look at those uh, after you after you hear this next uh, hour or so worth of, of information. So we're going to start off by going through some of the background introductory materials on, on why we wanted to put together this framework of hierarchy of contamination controls. And, and probably if you're on this webinar, you, um, you're you aware of, of the concern and the incidence of cancer in, in the fire service and the increased risk that has been shown through some very rigorous statistical uh, analysis of incidents in the fire service compared to the general population. And while there has been a, a number of studies that have been conducted throughout the years, it was really in 2013 when a study published by our friends at NIOSH, uh, led by Doug Daniels, where they looked at 30,000 firefighters from departments in Philadelphia, Chicago, in um, San Francisco, and compared to those firefighters to uh, individuals that live in the same communities and looked at relative risk. And they found, compared to the general population, that the fire service has an increased risk for esophageal cancer, intestinal cancer, lung cancers, kidney, oral cavity, as well as mesothelioma compared to the general population, as well as increased risk for bladder and prostate cancer and younger firefighters compared to uh, younger uh, individuals in the general population. And this was one of the uh, really groundbreaking papers that came out and helped to, to frame some of the risks that we have in the fire service, but also helped to understand where we should focus a little bit more research and also provide some uh, support for the um, for the ability to um, have cancers covered uh, from an occupational exposure perspective. But this is also just one of many papers uh, since that time that have been published in the United States uh, as well as around the world, particularly in Europe and in Australia. And because of all of that information that has come together throughout the years, late last year, uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, gathered all of this information together. Much of the research that has been conducted here within the United States as well as around the world to determine the risk classification for the occupation of firefighting. And a result of all the research that had been conducted, occupational exposures of firefighter has been categorized as a group one carcinogenic to humans, particularly for some of those cancers we just talked about in the previous slide. Sufficient evidence for cancer in humans from mesothelioma and bladder cancer, as well as limited evidence for a number of other cancers, including colon, prostate, testicular, melanoma, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And what was important is that the research has showed that there's a strong mechanistic evidence for how firefighters might be exposed on the job that can re result in some of these increased cancers. So thanks to this incredible amount of work, we now understand that the risks are increased and there is little to no doubt that this can be uh, traced back to some of the jobs or some of the um, occupational risks of being a firefighter. So what the goal is now is to understand what we can do to help to reduce some of those risks. What are some control measures that can be put in place to help drive down those risks and reduce the, uh, the possibility of, of contracting some of these cancers? And there's many different ways that we can think about this. We're not gonna touch on some of those that deal with lifestyle or shift work or some of the other aspects of, of the firefighter's day-to-day -day life. We're gonna focus a little bit more on what they might be exposed to when they're working on the fire ground, as well as how those exposures and those risks can come home to the fire station. So in this uh, scenario, we're going to focus really just on the exposure to contaminants and what we can put in place to reduce some of those risks. So again, we need to think about what are those contaminants that we're interested in reducing the exposure to. And there's been a great deal of research over the past decade that's really kind of started to hone in on what are those products of combustion that are in the air during a fire event and then can be uh, available for exposure to, to firefighters. And we don't have nearly enough time to go into each of those different categories, but on a high level, 
Much of the research has focused on polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, and this is a large class of compounds, but some that you hear uh, very frequently discussed are benzoapyrene, and that's actually a, a group one known carcinogen as well. Uh, naphthalene is another compound within the PAHs that is typically found in some of the highest concentrations on the fire ground or on the training ground in terms of all these PAHs, and that's a group 2B uh, possible carcinogen. We're also interested in volatile organic compounds. Now, again, another large group of, of compounds that can exist within this category, but one that we see at relatively high concentrations, particularly relative to occupational exposure limits, is benzene, and also a group one known carcinogen. A lot of research is starting to focus on aldehydes. And again, formaldehyde is the one we see at relatively high concentrations compared to occupational exposure limits and also a group one known carcinogen. But there's a number of other products of combustion that we're concerned about, acid gases, dioxins, furans, and many others that can be available for exposure to firefighters in the fire ground environment. And furthermore, particulate matter. And particulate matter can be of various different sizes from submicron, less than one micron in size, so smaller than the diameter of your hair, up to relatively large particulate that we can see quite easily with the naked eye. And different sizes of particulate have different risks in terms of where they can be, um, where they can get into the body and how far they might be able to go into, say, the respiratory system. And there's also some of these other compounds that may absorb onto those and then be delivered to the body through inhalation or ingestion as well. Now, it's not just the products of combustion that we're concerned about. It's also true that the materials that are in our homes, the fuels that most people call furniture that are catching fire while we are going on a structured fire response, have other compounds that are added to them for various different reasons. And these may not be completely broken down, but may be released into the air during the fire event. So one specific type of compound that's of concern are flame retardants that may be added to the furnishings to reduce the risk of ignitions. Once they actually do ignite, these can be uh, brought into the air and then can expose the firefighter through the gear as well as through other routes of exposure. Additionally, there are compounds that are added for stain resistance, such as per and polyfluoroalkyl substance, which can also become uh, released from the fuels for exposure on the fire ground. There's the per and polyfluoral alkyl substance or PFAS can also uh, have increasing exposure risk to firefighters when we're using the tools that we use on the fire ground, such as aqueous film forming foam. And there's also concern about the risk of these compounds in the firefighting gear themselves as they produce, provide some level of durable water repellency but may be able to come off of the gear and then further expose the firefighters. So the tools and the equipment that we wear are also important to understand as they may provide contaminants that are available for firefighters to be exposed to. And this doesn't just include contaminants that are on the fire ground. Diesel exhaust, for instance, is also a group one carcinogen and can contribute to exposures while we're on the fire ground, but also on any emergency where a diesel apparatus might be idling or we might be working near a diesel exhaust system. And particularly when we go back to the station where diesel exhaust can be uh, present both in the station and around the fire station if proper controls are not in place. So we have a number of different exposures that are done for different compounds that we might be concerned about exposure to. Unfortunately, there's three different ways that we can really focus on reducing some of those risks in terms of how they might get into the body. So the exposure pathways, how those contaminants get from the air, from the environment into the firefighter's body, we can think about three different mechanisms. These are the mechanisms we want to put controls in place so that we can reduce the inhalation exposure, the ingestion or dermal absorption or absorption through the skin. Now, inhalation exposure is something that we can control quite well while inside the fire part. When the self-contained breathing apparatus is used, it can largely eliminate inhalation risks. However, they have, when the SCBA is not used, particularly when firefighters are outside, and particularly when gear that may have become contaminated can off-gas after it is being worn, those inhalation exposures can continue even beyond the firefight itself. 
We know that ingestion can occur when some contaminants might work their way into the oral cavity and then be swallowed and be absorbed through the digestive tract, but also if skin is not cleaned when firefighters are eating, such as during rehab on the fire ground, where they can further ingest some of the contaminants they get onto their, their hands or their mouth, and also through skin absorption. While we know the gear does a great job of protecting us from fire ground contaminants, it is also not perfect. And so some contamination can get through and get onto the skin. And the longer it's on the skin, the more time that it has for absorption through the skin. So those are the three routes that we want to really think about how we can control from each of the contaminants. And in this presentation, in this work, what we try to do is frame the different groups of control measures using the NIOSH hierarchy of controls. Now NIOSH, the, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, has developed this model for all occupations, not just for fire service, and for many different types of risks that we might want to control for. And you can see that there's five broad categories. And most typically, those on the bottom, substitution elimination, are more effective than those that exist on the top. Now, unfortunately, instituting the substitution and elimination controls are much more straightforward to, to do to implement when developing a new tool, technique, or um, occupational approach to some uh, risk. When the um, risks are less well controlled, are more dynamic, or may not be able to implement some of these controls from the very beginning, we often have to rely on personal protective equipment or administrative controls in those processes. And unfortunately in the fire service, and as you'll see looking at the, the, um, the research that exists in all of these areas right now, we tend to focus much more on the higher end of the hierarchy of control, which unfortunately are not typically as effective to implement as those that are lower. But before we, but let, let's take a look at each of these uh, different groups in a little bit more detail. I'll go through them very quickly here and then we'll spend another 30 minutes or so going to them in detail. So PPE, as you might expect, providing a, a layer between the firefighter and the environment with which they're working. And these can be implemented by the design of the gear, the design of hoods, as well as the consistent use of the personal protective equipment. Administrative controls focus on changing the way that people work. Some of that has to do with cleaning up and hygiene during and after a firefight, but also the way that firefighters work on the fire. Couldn't think about tactics, having individuals on scene to rotate through the gear, but also the process of putting on and taking off of their gear. Engineering controls tend to focus a little bit more on isolation. How can you isolate the workers from the hazard that exists. So we can think about how we can design different tools to isolate firefighters from contaminated gear, how the station can be designed. And diesel exhaust capture systems are one of those very common examples of isolation controls. Substitution is replacing the hazard. And you might not be able to replace all of the hazards, but there are certain places where we're in a little bit more control over the hazards that might be available. We can think about the training fire environment and how we might be able to select the fuel packages. We might be able to replace hazardous chemicals that we use, such as in the uh, foams that are applied to liquid fires or that are used in the, the PPE that we purchase. And replacement of the diesel apparatus to reduce exposure risk to the diesel exhaust. And then finally, we can think about eliminating. And it's not likely that we're ever going to completely eliminate the fires that are we're going to be responding to. But locally, it's possible to reduce some of those, to eliminate some of those individual ignitions through community risk reduction actions. So I'd like to go through each of these in just a little bit more detail before showing you where you can find some of these resources. And again, we'll start at the top, which is what most commonly used in the fire service, though unfortunately the least effective of the broad categories of the control methods. We're gonna start by looking at personal protective equipment in two different categories, respiratory protection and then the dermal protection. As I've already mentioned, SCBA provides the greatest airway protection available. 
has an assigned protection factor of over 10,000 times, which can, this means it essentially eliminates the inhalation of fire ground contaminants. However, we also know that SCBA use in practice may vary based on the job function. If we see these firefighters who are about to go inside the structure, SCBA use is necessary because it's impossible to breathe inside that environment. However, those firefighters who are on the outside, such as doing outside ventilation, working at the pump panel, or doing incident command may be less likely to use some of that SCBA. So we know that the use may vary with job function, but also oftentimes the supposed exposure risk varies with job function. If we look at the top right here, this is where we're going to expect to have the best use or the most uh, rigorous use of SCBA, but also the highest relative risk. Yet firefighters on the outside, such as the top left here, who might be doing outside vent, the temperatures might be low enough where they can breathe the air uh, without having uh, the, the acute thermal burns, yet there's still a high amount of concentrate, high concentration of contaminants that will be in that air, as well as we're working an outside vent up on a roof or uh, rapid intervention teams or other such uh, assignments that might be outside of the structure. This is really important when we think about the overhaul aspect of firefighting, because often once we get to overhaul, the thermal risk is largely gone. And oftentimes there's relatively low levels of smoke that might be in the air. On the other hand, this is often a job that takes much longer than the actual firefight itself. A typical bread and butter fire can be put out by the attack team in a matter of minutes, whereas the overhaul might take tens of minutes and upwards of hours. So the need to maintain airway protection throughout that time and then into the investigation period is really important when these things can take hours in when investigation up to days. So this is where research is starting to help us to understand the trade-off between the respiratory protection that is need. And then once we move into investigation period, when we could possibly start to transition into other types of respiratory protection besides the SCBA, which are less likely to be used and are, may not be even feasible for the hours long investigation period. So respiratory protection is one of the best ways that we can protect from the dynamic, the ever changing environment in which we are responding to in the fire service. But there's also one that we need to enforce as much as we feasibly can in order for it to be effective. We also understand the importance of dermal protection from the, the PPE that we use in the fire service. Now, if you think about the evolution of uh, the, the bunker gear that we currently wear, which is focused on the dermal protection, over the past hundred or, or more years, this evolution has occurred really focusing largely on the thermal threat of the firefight to reduce the risk for thermal burns. And we know there's important trade-offs as we can get more encapsulated and provide more thermal protection with respect to the heat stress that firefighters might be exposed to while working inside of that gear. In recent years, we've really begun adding on to that uh, protection that we expect from the gear in terms of the chemical exposures that we might face. So we're going to talk just a little bit about a couple of different layers, and that's the bunker gear on the outside that uh, we typically think about from a thermal protection, the hoods and the development and the interface layer between the jacket, the helmet and the face piece, and then talk really briefly about the station wear and what sort of protection that might provide when we get down to that level. So again, the bunker gear has evolved uh, quite a bit over the last several years, and there's many different designs that have been implemented throughout time. And I would say, first of all, have to reinforce the value that this provides in having additional layers between the firefighter and the smoke that is available to be dermally absorbed. All of the layers can provide a very important barrier, but they're not perfect. And this is where some of the design elements the design choices that firefighters can make can help to change that exposure risk. One piece that you might be able to specify, for example, is the closure of your coat. So on the left here, you can see a zippered closure with a flap, and on the right is a hook and D type closure. And the hook and D closure is something that was a little bit more traditional from the, the older style gear. They're very robust. They last a very 
uh, very well in the rough and tumble conditions that we expose the PPE to. Whereas the zipper may be a little less reliable, more, uh, more common failure point than some of the hook and D. But you also notice the hook and D allows more spaces, more gaps for where smoke might be able to work its way inside the, the gear. And we found that there is actually increase in the amount of the PAHs that we can find underneath the gear when using the hook and D type closures compared to the zippered closures. Something to think about when specifying your next type of gear. Again, there's many different things that go into these specifications, but we do see that that can impact the amount of smoke and the amount of contaminants that can get underneath the bunker gear itself. We also know that there's a lot of new designs that are coming out to look at improving the interface control. So reducing the, uh, the openings for some of the smoke to get in between the different layers of the gear. So traditionally, the gear that you see on the left, this is a study that was conducted at the Illinois Fire Service Institute where he looked at the exposure to, to base layers for mannequins with different, they're wearing different types of gear. And the gear on the left is kind of the typical passive overlap where the bunker pants are pulled up and the coat kind of passively overlaps it. There's, there's a, you know, six inches to a, a foot of overlap between the two um, pieces of the uh, personal protective equipment. But there's no tight overlap between each of those. And there's a passive overlap between the hood and the jacket as opposed to a longer drape and a, uh, a particulate blocking hood, as you can see on the right. You also see this kind of yellowish skirt looking material that's added on this set of gear on the right. And that's a, 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 an additional piece that helps tighten down the interface between the coat and the pants and reduce some of the pathway for smoke to get up into the area between the, the jacket and the base layers, whatever you might be wearing. And we found that these features, including moving on to even more uh, tightly controlled interfaces where the pant and the coat are, coat are joined together and what is basically a one piece set of personal protective equipment can further reduce the contamination that makes it underneath that gear. You can actually really see it visibly here with the white base layers we have our mannequins dressed in on the left where you can see a fair bit of contamination on that white base layer, but it's not nearly as present as we move over to the right. So these can have a positive impact in terms of what gets underneath the bunker gear, but there's also trade-offs there in terms of heat stress, in terms of the biomechanics of movement and research that is currently ongoing right now. Hoods are another area where it has been a great deal of, of not only research, but new technologies that have been provided on the, uh, on the marketplace. So again, the hood is that element between the face piece and the jacket that covers the head and the neck. And it has to be relatively flexible so firefighters continue to move their head so that there can be some heat loss from this area. But we also want to reduce the amount of contaminants that can get to the neck skin, which is relatively thin um, and is a place where we can see uh, absorption of some of these contaminants. So new hoods have been developed that uh, really do a great job of blocking particulates that can get through the hoods themselves. Greater than 99% in some case contaminant, re uh, reduction contaminants that can transfer through these hoods themselves. And they do provide an excellent additional um, protection for firefighters that are using these hoods. But it's also important to know that there are paths, other pathways that can be present, such as the gap between the hood and the face piece if they're not put on completely, or between the, the hood and the coat themselves. So we need to also think about how we put these new hoods on as an important way of protecting the firefighter so that we don't have some of the contamination that goes around that protection as opposed to now that it can't go through. And this is a picture where you can see some contamination on the jawline and around the neck of an individual where there was a gap in that protection between the face piece and the hood. We can still see this when hoods, regardless of the design, are not donned without any gaps remaining. And then finally, we want to think a little bit about station wear as a potential contamination control measure. Now, typically we don't think about station wear as, as another pathway to control the exposures as they get to 
the body. And oftentimes we might not even think about the contamination that might get on the base layers because oftentimes this dark navy blue, which is very common in the fire service, does an excellent job of hiding any of that contamination as we saw much more prevalent with the white base layers that we used in the, the, our studies in the past. Regardless, we need to understand that the base layers will be exposed to some contaminants because the gear is not perfect, because we do have some breakthrough and through the interface. And so we need to be just as rigorous with cleaning some of the base layers as we are on uh, the rest of the material, something we'll talk about in the next control measure. But we also need to understand that those additional layers might reduce the time that some of those contaminants might be on the skin themselves. So this is something that really became uh, apparent to us as we started working with firefighters from California who were more likely to wear shorts than those that we typically worked with from Illinois in the Midwest. And we could see some of this contamination for those who were wearing shorts that got onto their legs in between the socks and the shorts and were available for dermal absorption along the calf. Short sleeve shirts as well, where we can see some of that contamination that gets underneath the sleeves and then can be uh, absorbed through the skin on the arms. So there's trade-offs that we need to consider about using short sleeves versus long sleeves or shorts versus long pants in terms of uh, the heat stress that firefighters might be uh, facing while doing their job. And how can we balance that with the additional protection that might be provided? More data is going to be coming in this area in the coming years. But this is a conversation that we're starting to have with the fire service about those trade-offs and how you might prioritize one over the other. And as you're going to see with all of the control measures we're going to talk about here, this balance is critically important. Right. When we think about changes to PPE or changes to any other practice or procedure or tactics or techniques, we need to think about the holistic impacts because we need to be able to perform the jobs that are necessary to protect life and property on the fire ground. And we need to be able to do those things, understand that there's firefighters working inside the gear that we're designing or specking for them. And they have to also address risks from heat stress, changes in biomechanics of movement, which might increase risk for slips, trips, and falls or overexertion strain, the two leading cause of injuries on the fire ground. And the thermal protection that is provided is still critically important to keep the burn injuries as low as we possibly can. So we need to think about all of these things along with the contamination control aspects. And finally, at least on this topic, we know that protection relies on, on a number of assumptions. We know that SCB does a great job if it's fit properly, if it's worn properly, and if it's worn throughout the firefight. The same thing can be said for the bunker gear. It works quite well if it fits, if it's put on properly and if it's worn at the appropriate times. It's not perfect, it's getting better, but we know that we can help to improve the contamination control provided by the, the, the turnout gear, the personal protective equipment that's provided to the fire service by making sure that we use it appropriately. So I wanna turn attention now to administrative controls. And this is another area where there's been a fair bit of research yet several more gaps that exist in the research and continuing work in this area. So when we think about the firefighting tactics, think about how we might address this firefight here. And there's different ways that firefighters might work on the fire ground. So think about just the simple thing of putting water on the fire. Do we have firefighters who might work with an interior attack by putting water going in through the front door and then putting water on the fire from the inside compared to those who might use a, a, an attack method such as putting water from the outside initially and then transitioning to the inside and final water application from the inside such as you're seeing here in the video right now. We know that this, uh, this initial water from the outside can be very beneficial for the occupants on the inside of the structure, but there's also a, a question about how that might impact the firefighters work on the inside. Does it impact the thermal stress because you've taken the heat out of the fire? Does it impact the exposure level for firefighters? Because now you've cooled all that smoke and dropped the smoke layer down onto the firefighters themselves. And what we've found with, uh, with this study is that firefighters who used the initial exterior water transition to the inside actually had lower levels of a few PAHs that entered their body compared to the interior only attack. 
Now, that shows that the way that we fight the fires can impact the exposure level that the firefighters might face. But again, we need to balance this. The, the selection of attack tactic has to consider many different factors. And most importantly among those is life safety. Life safety of the occupants who might be inside that structure as well as for the firefighters themselves. So this provides some evidence that the way we work on the fire ground, the way we put water on the fire can impact the exposure risk for those firefighters. But again, we need to think about it. We need to select these tactics looking at a holistic fire ground condition. We also understand that having proper staffing on the fire ground is critical to getting the job done, uh, to getting the job done safely and, and effectively. And this is a, a manuscript that was uh, published by the U.S. Fire Administrator, uh, Dr. Lori Mormail, looked at on-scene personnel deployment and where you would use and deploy personnel resources from all the different apparatus that arrive on scene. And a lot of great information is shown here, what is necessary to get the job done safely and effectively, but it also showed us the value of using crew rotation for a number of things. First of all, reducing extended exposures. If the first in firefighter is going in here and putting water on the fire in the most heavily contaminated areas, if there's not enough individuals on scene who could come back in and do overhaul, those individuals have to go back out, swap out their air bottle and then go back in to do the overhaul and continue their exposure to those fire ground environments. We also know that it becomes more challenging for firefighters to continue to wear all of the weight and the restrictions created by the self-contained breathing apparatus. So it's more difficult to enforce SCBA use, not just to enforce, but for firefighters to maintain their SCBA usage while they're working on overhaul as the heat stress begins to develop and increase its effects on the human body. So having a fresh crew available, enough personnel on scene can allow us to have fresh crews to go into overhaul can more realistically enforce the SCBA usage without increased risk for heat stress, and also allow the initial attack and search crews that are working in the highest contamination areas to go into decontamination, begin their cl uh, skin cleaning and rehabilitation process more rapidly. So all of these things can start to work in hand when the control measures require a lot of work, a lot of coordination to be done at the front end to ensure that there's enough personnel on scene, whether that's having enough individuals on the first alarm calling second or third or multiple alarms or bringing in mutual aid to help make these different control measures a reality. We also know that after we get done with a firefight, the way that we take the gear off can impact secondary exposure to contamination. A couple of quick examples here. So this is a hood that is a particulate blocking hood. And as I said, it can block up to 99% of the contaminants that might be getting through the hood. So much of the contamination, most of the contamination of the fire ground that would get through that hood is now sitting on the outside of that hood. And the traditional way that we might take off our bunker gear is after removing the helmet, one of the first things that happens that hood then comes down around the neck to allow access to face piece straps to pull the face piece off. In that case, all those contaminants that we're now on the outside of the hood can be brought into contact with the neck skin, which we know is going to have increased temperature, probably very sweaty, and have more opportunities for that exposure to get through the skin, the relatively thin skin on the neck. So if we can just look at slight changes in how we take these hoods off, that can complement the evolution in the design of the hoods so that the PPE design can be complemented by the administrative control in hood doffing process, where instead of taking the hood down in order to access the straps, maybe the hood can come off over the top and then the straps can be accessed and the face piece can come off. We actually found that comparing the relative impact of the hood design versus changing the way we doff the hood so that it doesn't come down around the neck, the doffing can be more impactful in terms of what contaminants end up on the neck after the firefight has been conducted. And there's a lot of different ways that we might be able to think about changing the way that we doff these hoods to reduce that secondary contamination or cross-contamination. 
The last example I want to show here is, is the gloves. Um, and gloves are one of those pieces of uh, personal protective ensemble that we know are, are one of the most, if not the most contaminated. You think about what you do on the far ground as you're crawling through the contaminated uh, uh, interior of a structure, uh, using your gloves to, during overhaul, handling uh, all sorts of contaminated materials on the inside of the structure. So that's the, the part of the PP that we see as typically the most contaminated. It's also oftentimes one of the first parts of the first protective equipment that come off when you go outside of the structure. And that provides some immediate thermal relief when you're, you get some cold air on your hands, makes it easier to take off some of the other pieces of the personal protective equipment. But think about all of the contamination you can see in the firefighter left here, all the contamination on the outside of that glove, if that's taken off and then carried on the inside of your hand, all of that contamination then gets on to the hand, which can then be spread around to different parts of the body as well as potentially made available for ingestion if food is being eaten without further cleaning of the hands. So being careful to doff the gloves so that there is no contact with the outside. And then when possible, putting on um, nitrile gloves or, or other EMT gloves that can reduce that additional exposure to contaminated gear as you continue through the doffing process can help to reduce some of those risks. And the last bit we're going to talk about here in administrative control is post-fire cleaning. And this is where there's been a great deal of focus and effort over the past few years, in particular looking at cleaning of skin and cleaning of the personal protective equipment. But we know that really needs to extend all the way back to the station, to cleaning up the apparatus and the station, because some of those contaminants don't just get left at the fire ground, they can come home with the firefighters themselves. So when we think about cleaning the skin, again, the more rapidly that we can get the contamination off of the skin, the less time that it's available for dermal absorption. We know that using wipes or soap and water on the scene can reduce that contamination by about 50%, which provides an immediate reduction in some of the contamination that is available. But we also know that they're not perfect and we can do a more thorough cleaning by showering as quickly as possible. So if we can, again, with enough personnel on scene, move those individuals that are more heavily contaminated into the skin cleaning and back to the station for the showering as rapidly as possible, we can help to further reduce the risks for those individuals. There's a great deal of research that's going on right now in terms of how we might be able to improve the skin cleaning capabilities on the scene, as well as improving the uh, materials that might be used, the soaps and detergents that might be used in showering as well. Personal protective equipment is another piece of the cleaning uh, pathway that has received a great deal of attention. Uh, and we know that by using on-scene preliminary exposure reduction techniques, which is, is what it's been called and, and codified in FP 1851, we can reduce a fair bit of the contamination or leave them behind on the fire gun. This is particularly effective on the outer shell of the gear where we can remove up to 85% of the PAHs on the outside of the bunker gear. But we also know again that that's not perfect and it does not remove as much of the contaminants on the inside of the bunker gear. So we want to move through the cleaning processes that are outlined in 1851 into laundering or advanced cleaning so we can get a more thorough cleaning of the gear itself. The apparatus itself can be a way, can be a, a, a place where contaminants begin to build up, particularly on the fire ground, if windows are left rolled down or if there's some other pathway for contaminants to get into the apparatus cabs. We want to do everything we can to reduce that during the firefight themselves, keeping the windows rolled up, keeping the air exchange just on the inside if it's feasibly possible, as well as not putting heavily contaminated tools and equipment back in the apparatus cab. But we know that sometimes these materials will find their way back into the apparatus cab and respiratory protection is obviously not used in the apparatus cab themselves. So it's continuously cleaning the hard and soft surfaces within the apparatus cab will help to reduce some of those risks in the cab as well as back at the fire station where contaminants can come back from the tools, from the equipment, and from the apparatus themselves. And cleaning all of the hard and soft surfaces can help to reduce the dust that can collect, dust which is known to have PAHs, to have some 
flame retardants, as well as the PFAS compounds that can be exposing firefighters at the station well after the firefight has been conducted. So when you think about changing the way firefighters work and cleaning, we have to understand it doesn't just stop with the skin and the gear. To be as thorough as possible, we need to institute controls for the apparatus and station cleaning as well. I'm going to move on to engineering controls here and talk about how we might be able to isolate people from the hazard. So we know that the personal protective equipment can absorb contaminants during the firefighting operations. And we know that some of these can, can then off gas into the environment where firefighters work. The volatile compounds tend to off gas relatively quickly over minutes to hours, which is semi-volatile compounds may continue to off gas for hours into days and may be more difficult to get out because they can get into the structure or into uh, the material itself and not as easily removed either through preliminary exposure reduction or decon. So we need to be careful of isolating the equipment while we're in rehab in the apparatus cap to keep that gear, even if it's been through preliminary exposure reduction, isolated from individuals who might be in the apparatus cab and then back at the fire station. We can do that by providing physical separations between firefighters and contaminated equipment, whether it's through signage or specific enforcement at the station itself, or by using gear bag, which can be used, can put a layer in between the contaminated personal protective equipment or tools that firefighters work and the environment around them for the trip back to the station or even in the station itself. The design of the fire station can also support isolation of living quarters. This can be done in some cases as a retrofit of a fire station, but this is again often much more easy to implement as fire stations are being designed themselves. When feasible, we know that we want to maintain a positive pressure in living quarters relative to the engine base so the contaminated air doesn't move in to the living quarters. We want to limit the amount of time that firefighters spend in these dirty areas. Sometimes the apparatus bay or is the area where we have enough room for individuals to work out in their station. Yet that's also the area where you typically will find some of the highest levels of contamination. So finding other areas where firefighters to exercise and to to work together outside of those dirty areas can reduce some of those risks. And by keeping the dispatch centers, office rooms, in basically any living space like common rooms or bedrooms, as far away from the truck bays or changing rooms, unless an effective isolation is possible, can help to reduce some of those risks. Fire station design, again, is maybe a relatively costly control measure to implement, but things to think about as stations are being designed in your jurisdiction or as you're going through retrofits to those stations. Diesel exhaust control is, is one of the control measures that has become very common in many different fire departments around the country, and it is a very effective isolation measure. Again, we know that diesel exhaust emissions are classified as a group one known carcinogen, and the local ventilation systems can be very effective at reducing this risk in the fire station. However, studies have shown that the maintenance, which probably goes without saying, but maintenance of the systems is, is critical. Uh, there was one study in particular that showed when, state, when the systems were not operating to the level they were designed or expected, contaminants were still able to get into the fire station, even though the firefighters thought they were being protected. So just installing them is not enough because we have to maintain their use and their ability. Other studies have shown that if controls are not in place, these diesel exhaust controls are not in place, even a simple operational check of the apparatus at the beginning of, of the shift can contribute in a, a very important manner to the overall particulate matter contamination in that gear. So employing and continuing to use and maintain these exhaust control systems is important. All right, we're gonna get into those last two and go through them relatively quickly because there's not as much information that's available, though areas where as researchers, we really need to drive some of, of the future work into. One area where we do have the ability to substitute what the hazard might be facing is in the training fire environment itself. And we know that the training fire environments are a environment that we have to balance the risks and the benefits. It's critical to prepare firefighters to maintain their skills through the training fire environment so that they know how to operate safely and effectively under controlled setting before getting out into 
a uh, real live fire response. Unfortunately, we also know that it exposes firefighters and instructors to known and suspected carcinogens, as well as elevated temperatures, low visibility, and a, a series of other risks. So balancing the two is critically important, as long as we need keep in mind the objectives of the training sessions themselves. The objectives of what the training fire environment are critical in terms of selecting the different training fire environments that we might use. But we need to look at this from a holistic perspective and consider some of those exposure risks when we are designing the training fire environments. And there's a number of different ways that we can think about doing that. One is through fuel package selection. And we know that there's a number of different types of fuels that can be used. And we're uh, working on a study right now, I actually have a paper in review at this point to look at the difference between wood and particle board and plywood and OSB in the training fire environments and how we might be able to control them, not only through what is being used, but how much is being used, how it's being put into the environment. What is there in terms of the impact of uh, them oriented on the ceiling versus the fuels that are oriented down near the floor where there will be more oxygen available to them? the ventilation of the environment. All of these substitutions are possible to be made to define the fire environment for the training objectives. Yet as we learn more, we can be more intelligent in selecting them based on the relative risks for the fire service. There might be cases where we can actually move away from life or we can substitute a training fire environment that has simulants, such as theatrical smoke, as you can see here in a digital means of creating the glow for a fire environment. And these can be very effective, though there's a limitation on what they can provide in terms of flexibility, the dynamics of their uh, environment created, as well as the changes in visibility. But these can be conducted without combustion in something we might be able to use this substitution when this environment may be more appropriate for the training objectives. Virtual reality is another one of those areas where there's a great deal of promise and a, a lot of research going on, when is the proper time to use virtual reality and how can it provide the right feedback for the firefighter so that the right message, the right uh, muscle memory is being developed and being reinforced. And this is an area where I believe virtual reality and augmented reality in the coming years is going to have a dramatic impact on training of firefighters and how it can be used not to completely eliminate or substitute for the uh, live fire training, but it can be supplementing and be used in a way where we can further balance those risks and benefits of training. There's a lot of effort that's going on for chemical substitutions. As we know, firefighters' exposures don't all come from products of combustion. Some of them may be from the materials that are released from the uh, fuels in the, the buildings that we're responding to, as I mentioned earlier. And we know flame retardants, and one of those that have known health concerns and an area where the fire service has been engaged in legislative activities, both statewide and nationally, to replace certain flame retardants with non-toxic alternatives. The International Association of Firefighters and Pat Morrison has been leading some of this effort to try to enact legislation that will help protect our firefighters by moving some of these uh, more toxic flame retardants out of the materials that will be available for exposure. Per and polyfluoroalkyl substance is another area where IFF and many other groups are very active in trying to reduce their use in the fire ground, such as stain resistant fabrics and carpetings, which may become available for exposure. Remove, replacing the aqueous film forming foams with fluorine free alternatives, an activity that's ongoing all around the country at this day and age, but also one that's relatively expensive and through legislative activities, financial support and motivation for this has become possible. And those PFAS compounds that are incorporated in firefighting PPE, a great deal of research and activity is focused right now on alternate materials that can be used to provide firefighters with the protection that's necessary in the fire ground without having some of these fluorinated compounds in the PPE. These activities take a lot of effort, in some cases, some national organizations, and we're very fortunate to have the leadership of IFF and many other national organizations to help push for some of these changes that will help pro provide protections for all of our firefighters. And the last piece that we're going to think about from a, a substitution perspective is replacing diesel apparatus. Now, this, again, is a potentially a relatively expensive 
substitution. And there's a whole lot of different things that have to be considered when a department is specking out their new apparatus. But remember that diesel apparatus, the exhaust, diesel exhaust is a group one known carcinogen. And by replacing diesel apparatus with hybrid or fully electric apparatus, when it's feasible, can reduce the risk for some of those exposures to particulate that uh, result from uh, internal combustion engines using diesel fuels. Something to consider again, as we're making some of these specs in the future. The last bit, which unfortunately we have by far the least information about and almost no research is the impact of physically removing the hazard. But we can understand the benefits of eliminating unwanted fires, even if the research isn't there to quantify it at this point. Again, we're probably not likely to ever completely eliminate unwanted fires in the foreseeable future. But if we can locally reduce those fires, we can locally eliminate the fires that the firefighter has to respond to or the complexity of the firefighter responds to, which can reduce their risk by eliminating those individual events for exposure to contaminants. Just a few examples of how we can do that. Public education, by reducing each one of those ignitions, whether it's through candle safety or um, understanding the risks of, of different, um, different fuels or different um, ignition sources that are put into the environment so we can reduce each one of those exposure risks for the firefighters themselves. Automatic sprinkler systems can reduce that fire, but hopefully to a post or before reaching flashover, and provide protection for those firefighters to respond to a less complex scenario with smaller amounts of contamination in the air. Smoke alarms might allow individual occupants to put the fires out before they transition to fires and at least eliminate the need for rescue if they can make their way out of the structure before the firefighters arrive. We even think about this as an exterior fire removal. By having a zoned remo removal of the fuels around our structures, we can reduce the risk of those fires that start as grass fires or garbage fires that eventually work their way into the structure. And in some cases, such as we've seen out west recently, result in very large losses of, of life in some cases and thousands of structures that become very complex evidence for the firefighters to respond to. So we can think about a number of different ways in which we can institute controls. There's not just one silver bullet that we can implement in the fire service to control all of these hazards. And we can think about this as a tiered approach to how we might be able to not only implement controls in the fire service, but how we might also start to think about the research that's necessary to further motivate and understand the relative benefits of each of these control measures. So as I wrap up here, I want to provide you all with just a little bit of information on how you might be able to find some of this material. As I said, the uh, Fire Safety Academy for you all's FSRI has a 30-minute online program that you can get to directly by clicking on this QR code here or going to training, trainings.s, excuse me, training.fsri.org, and you can find this course on comprehensive cancer risk reduction strategies for the fire service. All the material that I just went through with you, you can have this assigned to anyone at the station who might want to learn more about this material and even get a certificate for completing this online program. It's broken down into modules that focus on incidents of cancer, exposure contaminants up to exposure pathways, modules on each of the five different contamination control levels that we talked about, and importantly, a little bit of information about the National Firefighter Registry. Uh, this program is, um, is also helping us to understand the value of additional exposure control methods, as well as the need for having a even more thorough understanding of the statistics around the cancer concerns in the fire service. I mentioned the great work that was done by NIOSH back from 2013, and the National Firefighter Cancer Registry led by our friend Kenny Fent is going to provide us even more information in the future that's gonna give us the best detailed look at the fire service and the cancer concerns in the fire service that we can. So I highly recommend that you take a look at the NFR. Registration is, is being rolled out right now and you can get more information on how to do that in the module three of this online program. 
For those of you who want to get a deeper dive, you'll find in each of these lift, each of the different pages, there's a little triangle here representing the hierarchy of control. If you just click on each of those triangles, you'll pop up what uh, the information is about each of those resources that went into that recommendation. If you click on the link there, it will take you to where you can find that resource online. This is a case where at the minimum, you can find the abstract of some of these papers. In many cases, if there has been um, an open access or the copyright has been paid for, you can download that manuscript directly from that location. All of those uh, nearly 140 resources, you can click to from that location. And you can also click to find each of those from the manuscript itself. So you'll see in the manuscript, all of the different re references have been linked. You'll find them in blue if you click on the blue link, it will take you back to the resources page. And you can find all of those resources at the DOI link from the references there. So again, you can find all 140 or so resources at those locations. Both of these are freely available. If you're interested in those, I'll leave the QR codes up on the screen as we finish up the presentation here. So I just want to conclude by, by thanking you for the opportunity to um, provide this information. Uh, I know the Grand Rounds, Sarah and your group, you guys do amazing work at getting a broad range of different material out to, out to the fire service, both to the researchers and those who are implementing these changes in the fire service. If you all have any questions, I know we're at the end of our hour right here, but happy to take them either through our social media channels or my email address is just simply my first name, dot last name, at ul.org. So that's gavin.horn at ul.org. So thank you very much and uh, turn it back to you, sir. Awesome. Well, I do not think that you disappointed as always, fantastic job. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>